Welcome back. You are tuned into your Feel Good Breakfast Show on this fantastic Tuesday morning. Lovely to be with you. Now, it is no secret that romantic relationships hold no comparison to the conventional old school relics of the 1950s ideals. Now, women earn more and have more freedom. Men are expected to be more present as parents. Couples are getting married later and having less children. But how do these shifting dynamics translate in queer relationships and are gender roles even still present. Now, to chat to us today, we have counsellors Ashley Lawrence and Luca Horn joining us. Ladies, thank you very much and welcome. Lovely to have you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. lovely. Uh, I'm just loving this. I'm loving the fact that we can talk about something in a different context. You know, and I was joking with you and about this confirmation bias. We all believe what we believe and we're just waiting for someone to prove it yeah. and give us Pretty that information. Yeah. The conversation has shifted. Not so many statements, a lot more questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we are coming from. And I think within a, the context of a queer or same-sex relationship, I code already. So I will, in my own male understanding of my space, I will immediately apply a more gender-specific role to one member mm. of that, mm. that relationship than another. That's got nothing to do with their choice, their coding. It's purely my perception. How do you think that translates into the lived experience of a same-sex couple because you don't want to start every relationship I've got a lot of really close friends but I don't feel the need to say okay well how do you want <laughs> to be spoken to <laughs> yeah. which is absurd but you've got to come from that angle so how do you think that lived experience plays out in this current climate that we live in yeah no I think that's like a, it's a really good departure point you yeah. know because a you know, as human beings, we do, we have a frame of predictability, right? That's how we understand the world. That's how we make sense of the world. So there is that initial sort of wanting to put people in categories. That's just what we do as human beings. Like we want to try and understand. Exactly. Yeah. We want to understand. We want to predict, you know, and there's obviously a lot of survival reasons for that. But now that, you know, time has moved on and we've essentially, you know, developed and transcended these categories and we're able to essentially have a little bit more of a critique on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're starting to, to, to look at that and understand that these assumptions can be harmful to people, yeah. you know, in, in queer relationships. It can and put them in boxes, it can make people feel stigmatized, and it can sort of give that idea that everyone has to conform to certain gender roles. Absolutely, and that is what we, yeah, I mean, what we are seeing in terms of what you're just speaking about, and sort of the outlook from the outside perspective, you know, looking in at a couple. When it comes to same-sex couples, Luca, what are you seeing? Are same-sex couples conforming to specific gender roles? And if so, to what extent? In your experience, what are you witnessing? Yeah, definitely. I think it really depends on like the interrelationship between specific couples. You know, it's, it's like every person is their own individual. Um, you can find same-sex couples that do conform to gender roles because that's maybe what they've like grown up with or, you know, the men do this and the women do this, you know. Mm. Um, but also you do get same-sex couples that question and challenge these roles. Um, and I think it's very much the same as um, these days heterosexual couples. Some of them also are questioning these gender roles. And I think it's like a overall movement towards kind of breaking this, this bind that people have. Yeah. Um, I think that same-sex couples might tend more to, you know, break the, the, the stigmatise or the roles yeah. that they are because they're moving towards like a more open space and their relationship, you know, who does this, who does this? Be uh, because it's so, it's not as limited, it's not as confined. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it stems, and I can only speak for my own personal relationship, where my wife and I are so different mm. on every imaginable level that it, it is so tricky, and I'm blessed that I get to interview experts and, and thankfully not get charged for it every single day, <laughs> but um, there is something about this conversation that holds up a mirror to every person because it forces you to think about what you want out of that relationship. Mm. And that, that transcends, and I'm so glad you used that word, everything. For a queer couple that is now trying to come to terms with this conversation about understanding what each other need, mm -hmm. it seems like the starting point has to be a question. What is that question that I ask my partner when entering into that level up of a relationship? Yes, I think that's, that's, I'm sure you'll agree, absolutely so important. And I think uh, one of my areas that I work a lot with is couples counselling. Um, and uh, obviously queer couples, heterosexual couples, and 
at it, for every couple, the same thing applies. You know, what are your needs and what are my needs? And how can we negotiate that? What are your expectations of my role? Uh, what, what are my expectations? And that's going to look different for every couple regardless. Um, so I think having that, especially in the early on stages, you know, of, of meeting someone, what are your expectations in terms of gender roles, in terms of who's going to do what? How do you envision that playing out? So more match and, and fit, essentially. Yeah. That's how I see it. And I would sure. add to that because it creates a tempo of asking. It creates a framework of listening, mm -hmm. not hearing and spurting out. As you can imagine, there's a lot of spurting yeah. of verbal um, notions yeah. in my household. But how much of that is, is meaningful in that sense? I absolutely love it. Maybe this is the opportunity that you have been waiting for to take your relationship to that next level, but also to set yourself free. Mm -hmm. How do you identify your role in that space? And that's in relief to the person you're in relationship with. It's a two-way flow. Think about that. We're going to continue in just a moment. It's my feel-good breakfast show. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining our conversation around gender roles and now looking specifically within queer, same-sex relationships. Is that different? What are the challenges? We'd love to hear from you. 063-408-8863. Weigh in. We've got Luca Horn and Ashley Lawrence joining us, unpacking what has been the most interesting conversation. Oh, it's, been, wow. it's been fantastic because there's so many aspects to this conversation and we, but we're trying to hone in on it. But I think what we, what we you know, kind of established is the fact that how we grow up, what we perceive is kind of uh -huh. what we take in terms of our belief system going into relationships, into adulthood, into the working life. But bringing it back to same-sex couples, the challenges with regards to specific gender roles, do you feel the same type of challenges? Do you see that with regards to if you compare it to heterosexual? Um, relationships. What, what do you guys see in that space? 100%. I think, you know, kind of touching back on what we spoke about, it's like within the specific relationship dynamic. If, you know, one person, this is silly, but like likes cooking and, yeah. you know, then they can do cooking and the other person hates it and they can do something else. I think it's really specific with every single si uh, situation and every single relationship. Um, I definitely think there might be challenges that um, homosexual couples might face in with regards to maybe, you know, family or friends or people not quite understanding or supporting them. them. Sure. Yeah, I think that's maybe a very big thing because, you know, people fear what we don't understand. And I think if the people around um, homosexual couples um, don't understand, I think that can definitely put some pressure within the relationship. But I think if the relationship itself is strong enough in like, communication and all of that, I think it yeah. could be a very strong one. And it's your person. That's the joy of it. I, I think I found that shift when we entered into to marriage. It was like we're working on each other together now. And it's a slightly different notion than yeah. just being in relationship with someone where it's give and take. Mm -hmm. Now it's like we're trying to unlock for each other, trying to transcend our childhood baggage. <sighs> this all being said, is there still a positive role for gender roles, these archetypes within society? Because I get a lot of strength when I know that it's my role to step up and do this. That's been the deciding factor for me in surviving this post-COVID nonsense <laughs> if I didn't have that notion. So is there space for that? Look, I think it's, it's really going to depend on your perspective. I think that um, on one hand, you could look at it from the from the exactly what you said from that perspective you know it gives us certainty it gives us a little bit of you know understanding of where we're going to place ourselves how we're going to identify ourselves so it gives us sort of a societal script so to say so when we're growing up we've we've kind of got these ideas and these norms right we can't just get rid of those entirely as much as we might we want to. We need a framework. We need a framework. In, yeah. But within saying that, I think, um, you know, the notions of gender roles are going to change a lot more and that definition than what it used to be. For sure. um, so I think there's there's going to be, you know, a big, a big shift between gender roles and gender identity and how we're assigning that. Um, so I think there's, there's a place, but I, again, I think that they shouldn't be harmful, shouldn't be discriminatory, and they shouldn't, you know, ever bar anyone from, let's say, taking that on. So if I personally, as a woman, you know, really identify with the role of being a mother, um, 
you know, the, and that is a more traditional role, that's absolutely fine. We don't have to now throw out and, and uh, demonize all the old traditional uh, roles that we have. Absolutely. And I mean, I was speaking off air to, to one of the other counselors we had in an earlier chat. Mm. And with regards to that, to the old school kind of way with being a mother at home, stay at home with the, with the kids and sorting that out. Nowadays, in the, in the modern kind of society, it almost feels like there's a lot of pressure from other females looking into that scenario. Yeah. But hey, don't you feel like you should be able to go and have a job or doing that? There's a lot of pressure. But we are focusing on same-sex relationships right here. And I want to ask you guys, maybe advice for people out there watching in same-sex relationships, what advice can you offer, you know, maybe that's struggling with those gender norms, with the societal pressures placed upon um, a, a queer relationship? I mean, how do they go about navigating um, their relationship? Uh, does it come down to, you know, the two of them in the relationship, the communication, or trying to just shut out what society is saying? No, definitely. I think it's, you know, again, within the specific relationship, but of course, outside perspectives are going to seep in a little bit and they're going to maybe feel pressure to conform to things that they maybe would not want to. And I think that kind of, you know, throws the whole thing and makes it not enjoyable. Like if you want to be like the typical mother figure or the typical, you know, father, like patriarchal figure, then that's fine, you know, as long as it's your choice and as long as it's not kind of toxic in a way because it, you know, if you're pushed to do a role, later on you're going to resent the, the kind of the, for sure. box that you're being put in. And that kind of takes away from the joy of being feminine or being masculine, you know, regardless of your sex. Um, so, yeah, definitely. It's a dynamic tension, and I think we've got to kind of understand that there's always going to be two polarities, kind of, and that's the joy of a relationship, the good and the bad, yeah. is that you've got this dynamic tension constantly moving you forward. I think a good way to look at it, something that I've tried to kind of distill, is if it's freeing you, if it's motivating you, if it's elevating you, and if it's elevating your partner, then you know you're in the right space. If it's limiting you, if it's holding you back, then you know you are implementing that tool in the wrong way. It's just about finding the right way to activate your relationship, because that's the joy. It's something that keeps, keeps on giving you, keeps on evolving you, and that's where we are right now.